Good evening, this is Pastor Dominique from Evander Revival Center. I greet you in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And I want to share a word with you today that we find in the book of 2 Samuel chapter 9. Now, I want to share the story with you. And I want to show you how this is the story that we find in the book of 2 Samuel. How it is relevant to us today. Now, listen to what the Bible says. And I'm going to read from verse 1 right down to verse 9. And the Bible says this. Now, David said, Is there still anyone who is left of the house of Saul, that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? And there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Seba. So when they had called him to David, the king said to him, Are you Seba? He said, At your service. Then the king said, is there not still someone of the house of Saul to whom I may show kindness, the kindness of God? And Seba said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan who is lame in his feet. So the king said to Seba, Where is he? And Seba said to the king, Indeed, he is in the house of of Machur, the son of Amiel, in Lodibar. Then King David sent for him and brought him out of the house of Machur, the son of Amiel, from Lodibar. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, had come to David, he fell on his face and prostrated himself. Then David said, Mephibosheth? And he answered, Here is your servant. So David said to him, do not fear, for I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan, your father's sake. And I will restore to you all the land of Saul, your grandfather, and you shall eat bread at my table continually. Then Mephibosheth bowed himself and said, What is your servant that you should look upon such a dead dog as I? And the king called to Seba, Saul's servant, and said to him, I have given to you your master's son and all that belong to Saul and all to his house. And verse 13 of 2 Samuel chapter 9 says these words, So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he ate continually at the king's table, and he was lame in both his feet. Fascinating story. Awesome revelation. I want to share it with you. I am very fascinated with the life of David and I love to preach about David. If you look at David's life in 1 Samuel chapter 16, he is anointed king over the nation of Israel. But when David is anointed king over the nation of Israel, there is a king on the throne and we all know it's King Saul. So God anoints David while somebody else is still ruling and reigning. But God works in ways that we do not always understand because God's ways is not our ways and his thoughts are not our thoughts. God does not work on the level of man. No, he works at a higher level. He is the divine and God does things often in ways that we cannot always explain. So when God anoints David, Prophetically, that must still come to fulfillment. David was anointed by the prophet Samuel. But it took somewhat 10 to 13 years before that ever came to fulfillment. And I say that because sometimes you can receive a promise or a prophecy from God and become easily discouraged when it seems as if it's never going to come to pass. But a promise, a prophecy is like seed. And seed needs time before it produces a harvest. And it's in that time period where we can become frustrated or even discouraged. And we must be so careful that we do not allow ourselves to become discouraged and that we keep our eyes fixed on God so that we can see the fruition of the promises of God in our lives. Now, I want to share a scripture with you that I believe is going to encourage you and I believe it's going to speak to somebody. It's found in Habakkuk. 2 verse 3 and I'm going to read out of the contemporary English version. Listen to what this verse says. Habakkuk 
2 verse 3. At the time I have decided, my words will come true. You can trust what I say about the future. It may take a long time, but keep on waiting. It will happen. I feel that that's a prophetic verse for somebody that's watching. You're discouraged. Maybe you feel as if things aren't quite working out the way you expected and you've been trusting God. You've been keeping a good attitude. You've been remaining faithful. Well, I want to give you this promise of Habakkuk 2 verse 3. And I want to tell you at the right time when God has ordained it, it will happen. And if you believe that, say amen. Well, David had to go through the same process. He had a promise. There was oil poured on his head. He was anointed king. But for 10 years to 13 years, he lived as an outlaw. King Saul pursued him in the wilderness and King Saul constantly tried to kill him because King Saul was threatened by David. He knew that David was anointed, called and chosen of God. He knew that David had the potential to come and take his throne. And because he felt threatened by David, he wasn't a big enough person to accommodate David in his kingdom. So he pushed David out and pursued him and tried to take his life from him. But because God was with David, King Saul never ever was able to kill David. In fact, later on, King Saul dies at the hands of the Philistines, a tragic death. And when news reaches David at Ziklag in 2 Samuel chapter 1, we see how David weeps for Saul. He weeps for Jonathan. Now, David demonstrates a godly attitude in that scenario, in that situation. In fact, what we see begin to transpire from 2 Samuel chapter 1 right up to 2 Samuel chapter 4 is we see how there's a war that begins to ensue in the nation of Israel between the house of David and the house of Saul. The descendants of Saul make war with David's house and David who has got the tribe of Judah behind him and King Saul's house, who has now been given over to Ishbosheth, his son, who was the prince, and he took over from his father after his father had been killed. These two houses go to war. There's a civil war taking place in Israel right at the beginning of 2 Samuel. And as the civil war takes place, the Bible says in 2 Samuel chapter 3, verse 1, that the house of David grew stronger in this battle. Why? Because God was with David. God blessed David. And I want to tell you, you don't always have to have all the solutions. You don't always have to have all the answers. If you can just have God's presence with you, you will always have victory. You will always be able to overcome. And David's house grew stronger and stronger. But the Bible says there was a man, a captain of the army of Israel, who was opposing David, called Abner. He crossed over one day from Ishbosheth's house, who was the king of Israel, and he goes to David, who is Ishbosheth's enemy, and he goes to make an alliance with him, and he asks David to become king over the nation of Israel. Later, the king of Israel, Ishbosheth, is killed, and when he is killed, David assumes the leadership role as king over the nation of Israel. He combines Judah and Israel together, and they are united for the first time in years. God gives David victory after victory after victory over his enemies, not just in Israel, but over the Philistines and over the tribes and the nations that are surrounding him. And the Bible says that when David's enemy, Abner, who was the captain of Saul's army, who later on became the captain of Ishbosheth's army, who fought against David's army in battle when he is killed, David goes and he weeps at his grave. In fact, he weeps at his funeral in 2 Samuel chapter 3, verse 36. The Bible says that when the people saw this, when they saw how David was weeping for his enemy, he won the hearts of the people and they showed him favor and kindness because David had done such a thing. And that speaks to me because first we see David weeping over Saul, the man that pushed him out of the kingdom, the man that did him wrong after David had done so much good for his reign, for his kingdom. 
in 2 Samuel chapter 17 and 18, we see the exploits of David, how David does so much good for King Saul. And regardless of the fact that David did so much, Saul is threatened by him and chooses to want to kill him and pursue him and persecute him. But yet, when Saul is killed in battle, David weeps for Saul. He cries for Saul. He writes a song to Saul and Jonathan. And not only that, he rewards the people that actually bury Saul and Jonathan, sending them a compliment and saying, may God bless you for what you have done. So David shows kindness to his enemies and then he weeps at the very man that went out into battle against him, Abner, after Abner had been killed by Joab at Hebron, which is a whole nother story. And David weeps at his funeral. And the people of Israel see this and their hearts are with David and he wins the people over and he finds favor in the sight of people. I say this because there was so much of God inside of David. He had the characteristics of God that he was able to love his enemies, those that persecuted him, those that turned their backs on him, those that hurt him. David was able to weep at their casket. David was able to write songs for them. David was able to reward those that were kind to them. You see, you are never ready for promotion until you can weep at the failure of your enemies. Until you can weep at those who have gossiped about you, who have used you, who have walked over you. Until you can weep when those that have hurt you are hurting, then you're never ready for promotion. In fact, Jesus said it like this. If somebody slaps you on your cheek, turn the other cheek. If they ask you to take their coat a mile, walk two miles, go an extra mile. In other words, we must always be willing to bless our enemies and do what we can to bless our enemies. That proves that we are disciples of Jesus Christ. That proves that God is with us, that God is in us through the Holy Spirit, that we've got the characteristics of God. And that's not always easy. If it was easy, then everyone would do it. But it is possible with the Holy Spirit. And David weeps at the grave of his enemy, Abner. He's crying at the grave. But this was the very thing that brought promotion into his life, that he becomes the king over the nation of Israel. Now, while David is seated on the throne in 2 Samuel chapter 9, the thought comes to mind, is there anyone alive from the house of Saul that I may show kindness to them? Is there anyone from the house of Saul that's still alive, that I may bless them for Jonathan's sake. You see, David is the king now over the kingdom. His enemies have all been buried. But yet David is looking for an opportunity to bless their descendants. Why? Because he made a covenant, a promise to his friend Jonathan. And let me quickly go back. If you go back to 2 Samuel chapter 20, the Bible says that Jonathan, who was the son of King Saul, who was the king over the nation of Israel at that time, they made a promise to one another. In fact, they made a covenant, a solemn pact with one another. Now, a covenant in the Old Testament was like a binding contract and you could never break a covenant. If you broke a covenant, it was it was it was not right. It was actually considered the same as dying or saying that you don't want to live anymore if you broke a covenant. So. Breaking a covenant was a serious thing in the Old Testament. Today, we easily break promises in our culture, in the society that we live in. But in the biblical times, it was devastating if somebody broke a covenant. So David remembers the covenant that he made with Jonathan before he left the kingdom. And the covenant was that if one of them should survive or if one of them should outlive the other, then the one that outlives the other will bless the descendants of the other. You find that covenant made in 2 Samuel chapter 20, verse 14 to 17, where David promises Jonathan that he will look after his descendants and he will bless his descendants. And as a result of him making a covenant with Jonathan, his dear friend, David, when he finally comes to the throne in the nation of Israel and he's ruling and reigning in the nation of Israel, he thinks of that covenant. He remembers that covenant and he wants to honor that covenant. We see the characteristics once again of God. God keeps his word. God does what he promises. In fact, God will always keep his word. He will never betray his word. If he said it, it will be like that. 
His word will never return void. Isaiah 55 verse 11. So David is now on the throne and he's seeking somebody from the house of Saul, his very enemy, to bless. He calls forth a servant who worked in the house of Saul with the name of Seba. And he says, Seba, is there not anyone from the house of Saul that I may show kindness to? And Seba says to him, yes, Jonathan's son is still alive. Mephibosheth. He's still alive and he's staying in Lodibar. And then he tells the king that he's crippled in both of his feet. You see, the background to that story was in 2 Samuel chapter 4, when news reached the capital, the palace of King Saul, that King Saul and Jonathan had been killed in battle against the Philistines in 1 Samuel chapter 30, when, he, when they both had been killed in battle, the king and the prince, when news reached the palace, the Bible says that there was a nurse who was looking after Mephibosheth, who was the five-year-old son of Jonathan, who was staying in the palace. And this nurse took Jonathan, and as she was rushing out of the palace, she dropped Jonathan. And as a result of her dropping Jonathan, he became lame in both of his feet. And for the rest of his life, he lives with this handicap of being lame in both of his feet. Sorry, it was 1 Samuel chapter 31 where King Saul and Jonathan are killed in battle against the Philistines. And as a result of being lame in his feet, this now, this handicap brings poverty into his life. In the Old Testament, if you had a handicap, especially if you were lame and you could not walk, that means that you would have lived as a beggar for the rest of your life because you could not do anything. You could not work. You could not have an occupation. You could not go out and seek a job. So as a result of the wrong person getting their hands on Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, he becomes crippled for life. And for me, that speaks to me. I've got to watch out who gets their hands on me. I've got to watch out who speaks into my, my life, who, who actually I allow into my life, who I open up my heart to. And I want to ask you, who have you allowed to get their hands on you? You know, nowadays there's enough doctrine out there to confuse the normal Christian disciple of Jesus. If you just go into YouTube, there's enough videos out there to confuse a person of what is right and what is wrong according to the pages of Scripture. And I'm constantly bombarded with a video here and an article there of Christians, born-again believers, that are confused by what this person is saying and what that person is saying. And what happens is we've got skewed theology coming through the body of Christ nowadays, and now people are becoming crippled and they can't stand on their own two feet spiritually, so to speak, because they've been indoctrinated with the wrong doctrine. And we've got to be so careful that we only listen to what God says and what God says in his word. And if anyone's going to minister to us, it must be God's word. And the Holy Spirit needs to confirm this to us. We've got to be so careful of who gets their hands on us. I've seen it. I've seen how people turn to Christ. I've seen Satanists turn to Christ. I've seen some Gomas, witch doctors, turn to Christ. I've seen how people who were atheists turn to Christ. But the most difficult person to win over to Christ is a person with the wrong doctrine, a person that has been indoctrinated with the wrong doctrine. What is that? It's somebody else has got their hands upon this person and has crippled them spiritually, so to speak. Be careful of who, put their, who puts their hands on you. It's not only in terms of doctrine, but it can also be in terms of words, actions. Do you know how many people are walking around crippled today because of something their parents said? 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, something their father said, something their mother said. Do you know how many people are living crippled because of what somebody did to them? A father, a mother, a guardian, a family member, sometimes even a teacher or somebody that they respected and loved like a pastor just because of somebody's words and somebody's actions because somebody got their hands upon them. Now they're walking around crippled. And I want to ask you, are you walking around crippled? Are you crippling your feet spiritually, so to speak? 
I want to tell you, it will bring spiritual poverty to you. Jesus died to give you life and life in abundance. You are called to be an overcomer, victorious through Jesus Christ. You haven't been called to be handicapped spiritually for the rest of your life. No, you've been called to stand upon your own two feet. Think about that. Think about this. This man, Mephibosheth, in the scripture, cannot stand on his own two feet. Not only physically, but figuratively. So much so that he stays in a place with the name called Lodibar. Now, Lodibar, if you go translate it, means no pastures. In other words, it's a barren place. Cattle cannot graze there. There is no, uh, how can we say, there is no, it's not a well-watered place. Let's just put it like that. Lodibar is a dry place. It's a barren place. And that's where Mephibosheth stays. Mephibosheth was born into royalty. Mephibosheth was born to be a king. Yet because somebody else put their hands upon him and there was something that happened to him through a set of circumstances, he now lives in poverty. You can imagine he lived in a shack. He was living also in fear because all of Israel would have known that David was the enemy of Saul. There was no secret about that. In fact, the nation of Israel in this passage of Scripture have just come out of a very, very bad civil war. As I've mentioned earlier, between the house of Saul and the house of David. And one of the first, first things a king would do when he assumed the throne of a kingdom, when he took over the throne of a kingdom, especially when he took over from another king, is he would wipe out all the descendants of that previous king, of his predecessor. Why would he do that? So that he would prevent anyone from his family rising up and rebelling against him in the future. So it was common practice for kings to wipe out the descendants of their, of their rivals. But David comes to the throne and he does not think about wiping out the descendants of his rivals or his enemy. No, David seeks an opportunity to bless, to bless the descendants of his enemy, to bless somebody from the house of Saul, all because of a covenant and a promise that he made to his friend Jonathan. And Mephibosheth gets the news that David wants to see him. You can only imagine he must have been fearful because he doesn't know David like we know David. He doesn't know what's going to happen. He doesn't know the end to the story. So you can imagine he's hiding in Lodibar. He's in a barren place. He's in a dry place. He's living in poverty. He was born to be a king. He was born to rule and reign. He was born into royalty. But as a result of what somebody else did to him, he's now living with this handicap. And now the king that has come to the throne wants to see him. We know that he was fearful to see David because when he comes into the presence of David before his throne, the Bible says he lay down on his face and he went prostrate before David. And he said to David, what does my king want with a dead dog like me? In other words, he had this dead dog mentality. I'm a nobody. I'm a nothing. I'm never going to achieve anything in life. I'm never going to have any significance in life. I have been confined to my handicap. I cannot make anything. I cannot make anything of my own life. I cannot dream. I cannot live. I'm stuck with this handicap. And maybe this is the end of my life. This king is going to wipe me out. But God was with David and David had the heart of God. And David says to Mephibosheth something. He says to him, I want to show you kindness for your father's sake, for Jonathan's sake. Because me and Jonathan had a covenant. And I want to tell you, I want to honor that covenant. And as a result of your father making a covenant with me, I'm going to show you favor. As a result of somebody else making a covenant with me, I have remembered that promise that I've made to that person, your father, and I'm going to show you unmerited favor. You didn't do anything to deserve it. All you have to do is receive this favor that I give you. And you will now eat at my table. You will eat from my table and I will restore all the property that belonged to your father and to your grandfather, unto you and your descendants. 
and you will receive it. Everything that is owed unto you, you will receive. Mephibosheth. Can you imagine that moment? This man who's been living in poverty, who's been living in Lodibar, who's been living in a barren place, who never thought anything would ever come of his life, all of a sudden, in one instance, is shown kindness by the king of the nation of Israel. Is shown kindness by King David. That's what happens to us when we come to Jesus Christ. Jesus died so that we can come out of our Lodibar. So that we can come out of that dry, barren place, which is the world. Where we were in the world looking for fulfillment. Jesus died so that we can be delivered from the kingdom of darkness. So that we can come into his marvelous light. But he does this because he's got a covenant with the Father that he made through the cross of, the, of, cross of Calvary. We see this covenant in Luke chapter 22 verse 19 to 20. The Bible says Jesus instituted the new covenant at the Last Supper. And it was the new covenant that is written in his blood. The blood that was shed on the cross. It's a covenant that has been locked with the Father. And Hebrews chapter 6 verse, sorry, chapter 8 verse 6 to 7 tells us that Jesus has become now a mediator of a better covenant. A covenant that we can enter into. A covenant that you and I can have a part of. It's a covenant that we did nothing to gain. And all we have to do is just receive it. But I want to ask you, like Mephibosheth, Maybe you're stuck in your own lowly bar. Maybe you're stuck in a barren place. Maybe it feels as if things aren't going right. Maybe you feel other people have hurt you. And now you're stuck. I want to speak to you prophetically tonight. And I want to tell you it's time to come out of your lowly bar. It's time to come to the palace of the king. To sit and eat with the king. Jesus himself says in Revelation chapter 3 verse 20, I stand at the door and I knock. If you open up, I will come and have a feast with you. I will come and I'll eat with you. In other words, he wants to commune with us. He wants to eat with us. He wants to spend time with us. The Father wants to spend time with you. The Holy Spirit wants to be, wants to be present in your life. But are you eating at the table of the Father? Are you stuck in Lodibar? Are you stuck in that barren place? You've been invited to the king's table to feast at the king's table. You see, Mephibosheth had DNA of a king. He was born to rule and reign. He was born to rule and reign. But yet he lived in poverty. You and I were born to rule and reign. You know, the Bible says in Revelation chapter 1 verse 6 that Jesus Christ has made us kings and priests. We are made kings and priests. That's every believer to a certain degree has got dominion in the kingdom of God in this world. We have been called to be priests like the priest in the Old Testament that went into the presence of God and heard from God. And received revelation from God. We have been invited to be priests. You see we have been invited to rule and reign here on earth. Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 to 28. We've been made in the image of God to rule and reign and have dominion. But how many Christians do you know born again believers are ruling and reigning? How many born again Christians do you know is feasting with the king? It's time to come out of Lodi Bar. It's time to stop feeling sorry for yourself. It's time to stop believing that your best days are behind you. It's time to stop buying into the lies of the enemy and to believe that God has got more in store. That your best days are before you. That God wants to bless you. That God doesn't want to pay you back for the stuff that you've done in the past. For the mistakes that you've made. No, His grace has got you covered. If you have sinned, repent, turn to Him, live for Him. Live in a way that is pleasing for Him. We all stumble, we all fall, but you've got to get back up. You've got to keep serving God. But don't get stuck in Lodibar. Don't get stuck in that barren place. That's where the devil wants you because that's where he can keep you defeated. So that you can never realize who you are in Jesus Christ. Mephibosheth. 
had a seat at the king's table. And the Bible says for the rest of his life, he ate from the king's table. He feasted from the king's table. All because of a promise that Jonathan made to David. And I want to tell you, you and I can feast at the king's table. All because of a covenant that was made between Jesus Christ and the Father. And we get to partake in that covenant. I want to leave you with this scripture. Jesus Christ said these words in Luke chapter 4 verse 18. And this was the theme of his ministry. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. In other words, Jesus came to deliver us each and every one of us out of our Lodi bar. I want to ask you tonight, are you still stuck in Lodi bar? Are you still stuck in that barren place? It's time to come out. There's more in store. And I leave you with that thought. Amen. Let us pray. Father God of our Lord Jesus Christ, we come to you right now. And we want to thank you, Lord, for the revelation of this word. We want to thank you, Lord, that we can have a seat at the table of the King, which is Jesus Christ. That we can feast with him. That we can receive revelation from him. That we do not have to be stuck in our lowly bar no longer. No, we can rise up out of the poverty, out of the oppression out of the negative circumstances that life has plunged us into and we can become all that you have created us to be. I pray for every brother and sister that is watching right now, Lord, that you would strengthen their faith, that you, O oh Father, would remind them that they were born to be a priesthood, that they were born to be a holy nation, that they were born to be royalty in your kingdom. They've got the DNA of a king on the inside of them. They've got DNA of royalty on the inside of them. And I pray, O oh Father, that you would give them that revelation that they are a priesthood, a holy nation, that they are priests and kings unto you. Lord, I pray that in this hour, the church will rise up and know its identity in Jesus Christ, that we will become all that you have intended us to be in this hour, in this season, that the world may know that Jesus Christ is alive and that we may see the greatest revival that this world has ever seen. I pray, Lord, do a work in our hearts. Do a work in me. Do a work in every person that is watching. Lord, where people have handicapped us, where they've hurt us, those that have been hurt, those that have been handicapped by other people's words and actions and what they've done, abuse and neglect, I pray for healing. I pray for deliverance right now in Jesus' name. I bind you, Satan, over every brother and sister that's watching right now that is expecting deliverance, that is expecting breakthrough. Leave them alone in Jesus' name. And Lord, we receive heaven's best for us. Bless us this night. Watch over us. Guide and keep us. And let your presence go before us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, that's all that I have for you tonight. I want to thank you for taking the time to watch. And remember, Tuesday night, 8 o'clock, I'll be here on Facebook live tomorrow morning at nine o'clock. We've got a live church service in Afrikaans right here on Facebook. So if you want to watch that, please do. And I want to ask you, please take the time to share this word. I'm going to